Okay, so this is going to be kind of like the antithesis to uh, Remo talk. Good talk, by the way. Um, so, uh, my name is Dean. I am, I am a uh, developer at Nerfo. I am, and this talk is called Playing in the Mud. And I am, I'm primarily focused on microservices uh, at Nerfo. And I kind of wanted to talk to you. I wanted to show you a system today that we're going to, we're MITing and we're releasing and letting people play around with. Um, but I wanted to kind of come show it to you today and, and maybe talk about some of the reasons we did what we did or, or some of my beliefs, I suppose, when you're building uh, big systems. Um, so in terms of uh, Nearphone, um, we are building some, uh, we're building a developer-focused search engine, which we're gonna show today. Um, we're building tools to improve the developer experience and we're building just general systems that you can use as reference. So um, hands up who knows what a microservice is. Okay. Um, hands up who's ever actually played with microservices, a lot less. And hands up who works day to day on a microservice system. <laughs> and, and you see, this is the problem is, everybody talks about microservices, you come to these events, you get a little 10 minute talk about how great microservices are. They'll probably have like a quick couple of samples and then that's it. You're kind of left with, with nothing else. So everybody's telling you microservices are amazing. Nobody's actually seen what a microservice looks like. Um, we all know it's supposed to be about a week that you build one in. Um, we all know that they're supposed to be small and composable, but we don't have any samples. So we're going to change that. Um, and the reason we're doing this is we dog food our own work. So everything we do here feeds back in. We've got kind of a continuous feedback loop going in near form. Um, so we dog food our own work. So the tools I show you today that, that we're using to, uh, to, to run this system are things we've built ourselves. Um, we're going to be putting logging in that we've built ourselves as well, some really, really kind of high volume, um, low latency logging. Um, and we want to empower the community. So we can't go around telling you microservices are amazing and then not show you any microservices. Um, so we want to we want to kind of move things forward. So JavaScript microservices. Um, JavaScript microservices are interesting because you kind of have to throw the rule book out. So I thought there was a very interesting question there about um, how does TypeScript and, and other more static languages uh, fit into uh, doing microservices. And for me, they don't. Um, what I like about, no, and I, I do like TypeScript, um, but what I like about JavaScript is the inherent madness that it allows you to have. Um, and I, I, I think as a community, we should probably, <laughs> yeah, I think as a community, we should definitely embrace it. You can do some really cool things when you, when you kind of allow yourself to, uh, play around with, with JavaScript and, and microservices. So it's bye-bye comfort zone. Um, your your uh, monolithic um, ways of doing things don't work when you start doing microservices. So little things you thought were a good idea aren't a good idea once you start doing microservices. Um, so I've got three pillars, and I wanted to talk about these before I showed you the system, and I'm kind of hoping the system stays up long enough for me to show it. Um, but I've got three quotes that when we started this system, I really kind of took in um, and I, I, I've kind of developed, ser I've developed uh, software around these pillars. So the first one is from Alan Kay, who's the father of OOP. Um, so he calls it OOP. Um, what he really means is microservices. Um, and I believe this is something he said uh, long after the fact is OOP should have been what we call microservices now. So he says, I thought of objects being like biological cells and or individual computers on a network only able to communicate with messages. And what he's trying to say there is don't worry so much about how the system gets built together. Worry about how it talks from, from part to part because that's the important part and that's where everybody gets kind of mixed up and that's where the system becomes complicated. It's at the edges. Everything inside doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter if it's a big old ball of mud inside. As long as you can talk to it um, in various different ways and as long as it's easy to talk to, to your service, the inside doesn't really matter. Um, let me go to the next one. Um, a diamond is very pretty, but it's hard to add to a diamond. A ball of mud is not so pretty, but you can always add more mud to a ball of mud. <laughs> that one always gets a laugh. I love this quote. Um, so this quote is Joe Moses and or Paul Penfield. We're not sure who. Um, and I suppose that's apt for the quote. I, um, I really, really like this quote. I build software against this quote. Um, I write really, really fast software in terms of I can get you an awful lot of features very fast. It's 
probably going to look awful internally though. And you know what, it pays. At the end of the day, I still get systems out because it turns out that these little balls of mud, as long as they're small and manageable, it really doesn't matter. Um, as software developers, we have an awful tendency to worry about what's right instead of what's done. And they are two different things. And then the last one is from Richard Roger, who's our CTO and Chief of Madness. Um, software development is an art. It is not predictable enough to be engineer engineering. It is not rigorous enough to be a science. And if you think about that quote, what he's essentially saying is there's no such thing as a software engineer. It doesn't exist. You don't, like, as, as a software developer, you don't take the same oaths of responsibility as an engineer. So you can't call yourself an engineer. Besides, engineer is restrictive. Um, engineer means that you're going to follow practices and patterns and principles and, and rules. And that's no fun. I mean, why would, you, why would you bother having all these rules when your job title says you don't even need them? You know, so when you become a software artist, and if you say it to yourself, I'm a software artist, <laughs> and, and like it gives you a smile. Software artistry is fun. That's what software is supposed to be. Everybody in this room got into software either because it's fun or to pay the bills, in my case. Um, but in general, like you need to stop thinking about software as a science and more as something pleasurable that you can, you can play around with and grow into. And then all of a sudden you can make really cool things because you're not worried so, more or s you're not worried so much whether they're right, you're worried about whether they're cool. And that's, I think that's important. So I've got five tips um, that I suppose we've, we've figured out as we've went along. So these are things that I got wrong. Um, so I thought I'd come and share them with you so you can realize these tips and also get it wrong. Um, so, number one is if you're building microservices, each section of the system must run in isolation. If it doesn't run in isolation, you're going to have situations where two pieces will work together, but when you add a third piece, one other piece will fall down, and you'll have no other reason. And then you can't test them because you have to spin each tree, or you have to spin the tree up, and this guy's nodding, you know. You know, it's, it's horrible when you're trying to um, whack a mole, essentially, while you're trying to, uh, trying to figure out which service is causing problems. And this is very apt because we run, um, uh, the demo I'm going to show you runs on um, meshing technology. So I don't actually know, I, I know all of the ports, but I don't know which service is uh, on any given port. Um, so I have to go through the logs and figure it out. Um, this became a real issue once we got the system up and live because I couldn't tell where one system started and the other service ends. I couldn't actually talk to each individual one in isolation. Um, we've changed, or we've 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 put in a kind of a quick stopgap where it will just print out all the ports for me, so I can pick a port. And because it's a meshing system, the message will eventually get to where it's supposed to be. Um, but I can now run each individual service in isolation. There's a very very fine line between doing microservices and a distributed monolith. If you're going to be doing monoliths, do a monolith. Don't do a distributed monolith. There's no point in adding the network in for no other reason than because it's there. Leading into that, the network hates you. The network does not like you. It will refuse to participate at the most opportune times. I had a little laugh because I was down the back and I was trying to just get one or two things ready for the talk. And I seen a tweet go out from uh, Larry Voss, who's the CEO of NPM. And today, me and four other developers tried to figure out why the system just imploded on itself. I had a talk to do in four hours. It takes two hours for me to get here, so I had two hours to fix the system and to change up the talk a little bit. Um, it turns out that they decided to enable gzip today. So they, they thought, you know, compression will help people on smaller networks. Um, what they didn't say was they would enable this straight away and we didn't have any support for this. So every time we tried to talk to NPM, the whole system flatlined because it's a, it's, a, uh, it's a search engine for node modules. And without NPM, I can't tell you whether it's a node module or not. So it's a NPM became our source, source of truth. And uh, yeah, the network, the network decided that wasn't, that wasn't the way it was gonna play. It sent us back a couple of errors, which was to be fully expected because we were reading the data wrong and the whole system collapsed on itself. Um, we learned two things that day. One is resilience. Your services need to be much more resilient than you would usually give your, your uh, little subsystems credit for in a monolith, um, because a monolith will crash overall or it will, it will spin up errors and, and, and bring them up to the top. If you have little microservices each and all into its own, they'll just all start crashing randomly. You won't know why it is, 
Um, you'll have to go dig into your logs or you'll have to go dig into your metrics to try to figure it out. But uh, the network will, every single time, try and screw you over. It just does not like that. Track your vitals. So uh, I said we were putting in login. Here's the problem. When you're doing 10 services, each one scales. You can scale it by about 10. We now have 100 services. And this is just a small little, you'll see it's a tiny little application, but it's built in microservices. You can't track logs at scale. It doesn't work. So one of the things we've started to do, and I don't have it ready yet, but we'll probably come back and show it, is we are starting to pull live metrics out of the system and put them on a dashboard. Again, it's all built in microservices. It'll be the second system we show off, um, but it's, it's not ready just yet. But what we found is once you hit, excuse me, once you hit about five microservices, logs just become useless in real time. So it's great if you want to get through them after the fact, but they won't help you diagnose a problem in, in, in the lab. Four, version aggressively. So when you become a software artist, one of the things you do is you get these passionate little bursts of, of creativity. And you write out all this stuff and you push out version one. And then you keep going and keep going. And because you're doing these things in isolation and each little one is an island unto itself, you kind of sometimes forget to version. And you might leave stuff sitting in master. And then what happens is when the likes of, say, NPM decides, oh, we're going to uh, put zipping in, little things like the whole system going down happen. And then you think, it's fine, I'll roll back to another version. Only, I don't have another version because everything is in master. Um, and people, people laugh at this and go, oh my God, how could you be so stupid not to have things there? How many of you properly version everything all of the time? Or how many of you really leave it in master or on a branch? Uh, all very quiet, I know, I know. So um, do version aggressively. We, we, we've moved from kind of versioning every so often when we wanted to do a release to going to every single time there's a change, you get a version. That's how aggressively you need to version. Otherwise, it will eventually come and bite you in the butt. The last one is give it a week. Um, this became super important. So when you're doing microservices, there's a tendency to go deep down the rabbit hole and never come back. Um, so your boss comes in about three weeks later and they say, how's the system? And you go, oh, it's grand, I'm about 80% done. Um, does it run? No, not yet. I still have these four little bits to do. And then they turn into eight little bits and then 16 little bits and you never get anything done. This is, this is the sort of thing that plagues software development. Um, at Nearform, we do this aggressive once a week uh, demo. And the idea is it doesn't matter what you demo. It just matters that you have something to demo. And it keeps people honest. Um, you can't lie about a demo. You can't go in and go, oh, it didn't work, and I'm sorry. Like, the demo is what you've been doing all week. Um, by, by moving to doing a demo once per week, you're forced to do all of your features once per week. So if you've got a two-week feature, well, it won't fit. So you're going to have to break it down into weekly iterations. Um, and this can happen outside of, like, some people, some people don't get this authority. Maybe you're not allowed spam once a week. Maybe you've got a customer who demands an update once a month, for instance. Um, still internally do the weekly demo, because by the time you get to the month, you will have four weeks weekly demos aggregated into one monthly demo. Um, you don't need approval from management to do this. It's just that after you kind of hit about a week, stuff starts to slide, and things you did last Monday, you kind of forget about. And how I can prove this is how many people off the top of their head can tell me what they've done for the whole of last week on a day-by-day -day basis. You know, it just, you can't. So once you hit, <laughs> I see everybody poking their friends, um, once you hit a bit of weeks worth of work, what you need to do is section off, do a demo, and lock down your version so that if anything goes wrong, at least you have something to show. So I wanted to show you a demo. Um, today we're going to demo NodeZoo, which is our little, uh, our little search engine. And we're not trying to take over the world with this search engine. It's not for any other purpose than to demonstrate microservices. It's all MIT. It's all open source. It's all available now. And we develop daily uh, in the open. So you can come chat to us on Gitter. You'll probably see most of it me cursing at people and asking them to check stuff in. But uh, we're all there every day. And the tool we're using to run it is Fuge. So Fuge is a microservice execution tool. I don't know if anybody has heard of uh, Shell Help. And the idea is once you, once you do microservices, you'll notice a familiar pattern of about 10 or 15 little console windows. You know, one for your logs, one for Docker Compose, one for each service, which could be 10, one for each scaled version of each service, maybe one tracking your logging, and all of a sudden it just becomes a nightmare to use. Uh, Fuge is magic. So what it does is 
it will talk to Docker and it will proxy out over Docker so that all your services can talk to your Docker machine as if it's localhost. Um, it'll allow you to spin up new microservices so you can write generators. So let's say you, you're going to start writing microservices and you've decided on your, your de facto standard. Um, you can create a little generator for that and then just keep spinning up new microservices each time. It also allows you to do things like fake scaling and things like that, so you can spin up more versions. Um, it's up to your ser or it's up to your system or service to support that. Um, if you lock up your ports and crash the whole thing, it's not the user's fault as such. Um, it just allows you to spin multiple ones up. So, node zoo. So this is node zoo. Um, we'll do we'll do a couple of searches. So if I do, let me see, have I got nanite? We don't. So one of the one of the things about the the search is that it it only searches for stuff that I've already preloaded in, and I'll show you how we preload in. Um, what we would like to get to with this service is I don't know how many of you use GitHub for a lot of modules, but it, it doesn't really scale. And um, when you start trying to find like where's where's Travis for like this module, this module, and this module, it doesn't scale. What we want to yeah, so we you pretty much go back to Google. What we would like to do is is have Node Zoo up there as as a way of finding your modules, but not necessarily the main point. So it's kind of like a mini Google. It's the Google for, for, for just your modules. Um, so we can add modules in by going to the info page. And this is kind of a little uh, sneaky way of, of, of loading things in. Um, and the reason the reason we have it here like this at the moment is because when it goes live, we'll, we'll have like a little updater, and it'll pick out the most popular modules and keep them up to date. Um, but from there, um, once you go back into search, you can start searching them down. So we'll do a star dash. If you notice, the stars aren't done yet because we're really kind of rushed. We're kind of getting this thing out the door. Um, but that's that's pretty much that's pretty much the little uh, the little kind of search engine we have right now. And as I said, it's it's not it's not overly impressive in terms of, of an application. It's just your standard search engine. I'm sure everybody's done one a million times. What is impressive is how it's built. So. Um, each of these little little pieces here, and we'll just highlight them, um, are an individual microservice. Oh, that's my mouse. Is it only ever does this when you when you come down. Okay, I'm sure you can see. Okay. Um, so each microservice does a particular thing. So our little node zoo base is our auto meshing technology. Um, then we've got Nodezoo Info, which is the, the little microservice that's sending you back the details. We've got one microservice for each of our main um, systems. So we've got NPM, GitHub, and Travis right now. Cover all is coming soon, and there's some UI being put over so it doesn't look really ugly. Um, we've got Nodezoo Web, which is the actual web component. That's all built in React, ES6, um, basically the name of the buzzword, and it's in there. Uh, we're trying to keep this thing interesting to look at. Um, and then we've got Elasticsearch as well. So we have Elasticsearch running in Docker Compose because you should never spin up your infrastructure with your system because they will try and connect together at different points and blow each other up. Um, but Fuge allows it. So if you notice, even in Fuge, it will pick up Docker. Uh, sorry, Fuge will pick up Elasticsearch, but it will. I've made a setting that it doesn't run it. So it knows it's there and it knows to proxy the connection, but it, it, it won't touch it. Um, we can do some interesting stuff. So we can do like... Uh, if I do um, start node do search, I get a second a second instance scale. Um, so if we do ps, you see now I've got two two versions of search running. And how we do or how we enable that is that we use this little meshing technology. As I was saying, it's it's based on the swim algorithm. Um, it's very similar to what. Um, Uber are using with Ring Ringpop, um, but we don't use we don't use anything with ports. So let me just give you an example of that. Yeah, it is the swim algorithm. Oh, it's magic. That's about as much as I know about it. Is just that it, it's magic. Um, so uh, let me show you. Uh, I want to show you Node Zoo Search, which I can kind of give you an idea of what it looks like to create a tiny little microservice in Seneca that doesn't have any ports that will just automatically mesh together. Uh, so if we do Node Zoo Search, do Adam, because Adam is the best. I don't want to have anybody say anything bad about it. 
but it will take a little bit of time to spin up but yeah yeah it's pretty much Adam has become the new Eclipse so uh, you know it might run faster if they made it in TypeScript it would be pre-compiled um, so our little serve folder and let me see can we pull this so can everybody read that is that big enough can you read it all down the back awesome <laughs> who said no you can read it on the little screen oh my god so uh how how we spin together so remember i i, I said that uh messages were important and that alan Kay told me always to use messages and to be like sales and i believe him um we wrote a little a little thing for Seneca. So we use Seneca, which is a, a, a microservice system um, that was written by Richard, our CTO, a couple of years ago. Um, and it, it basically allows you to do pattern match based uh, logic. So the idea is that you have a little pattern and you can see one there, so role search, command insert. Um, and you're able to uh, wrap a piece of functionality. We call it an action handler, but it's essentially just a function behind that um, that does some work and returns a result. They don't have to return a, a result, so this is where the observe comes in. So if you want, for instance, multiple people to just handle it and acknowledge they've got it, you can do that as well. But the interesting thing about this is, if you notice, the only port that's in this whole uh, one is, is Elasticsearch. There's no other ports. Um, so in order for me to talk to this service, I need to automatically, or I need to, sorry, pick out one of the random ports it's auto-generated. So a couple of things I know is I know that it will start out in the 5,000 range and I know it'll pick anything within the 5,000 range bar a couple of specific ones that, that are used by uh, um, internal services on your machine. But if I do a search for Seneca, um, if I can pull this up. Let me just bring that. So you see we get back all, all the search results. And uh, the interesting thing is I, I pull the port out of a little, a little file we have that gets dumped out that gives you all the ports uh, for each, each network. So if you're big into logs, I can show you what that looks like. Uh, but there is there's absolutely no, there's no ports on my part. I don't set up any ports. And this is how we get away with scaling because all of a sudden if you don't have a port, you don't need to worry about crashing into each other. The mesh already knows what ports are taking. So every time I run um, uh, start XYZ service, it will just assign it a random new port. The mesh will pick it up, and it will all it will all go together. Um, so if we go into a uh, uh, system, so we've got this nice little um, we've got this nice little kind of uh, how would you call it? Like a a, a setup repository um, and it's got all our little uh, so oh by the way here's where I'm pulling out the ports so you see these are all the ports and every single message gets its own port it doesn't have to um, but we found it's a nice way of kind of it, it means we can tear up and tear down services and split them out and they don't always have to be the same shape we can break a service down in two and basically since every message is on a single port and we have about a thousand ports or a hundred thousand ports available we're good um, but all I have to do is pick any one of these uh, any one of these ports, and I can still talk to the system. And the reason I can talk to it, and I can make the lawyer out of me. No, good. The reason I can still talk to it regardless of the port is because of the meshing technology. It's, it's a gossip protocol. Everybody knows about everybody. Um, I can even stop the base and it will still work. Or at least they tell me it will still work. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, so if we stop the base, um, where's the base? So we stop search and you see we still get results and just to make sure that I'm, I'm not a liar let's change this to uh, what did we search low dash didn't we and you see we get low dash so it doesn't matter what port I use the whole system comes up um, so let me pop back up on my view it worked um, so I didn't show any code um, barred a little small sample and the reason is I want to push people to go explore the system there's uh, six repositories um, all at github.com forward slash nodes there's six repositories there's one repository which is your kind of your your setup repository you just pull it down and npm install huge build and it'll all it'll do all the magic um, 
it's a it's a big complex meaty system underneath a lot of the things we've exposed to the front end we've kept it simple just because we're kind of hoping people come in and do some front end working to get experience in microservices um, the whole system is MIT um, it's all available to play with and if you make something cool in it we'll actually host it for you so for instance the Travis one came to some random person who liked the idea of the meshing technology and had Travis and he, he wanted to know did we want the Travis module so we said yeah why not so we have another person who's doing the coveralls one as a school project, and we're going to put that live for them as well. So if you're a front-end person, if you're a node person, if you want to play with microservices, or if you've never actually done any microservices but think it's a cool idea and want to explore the system, um, come talk to me or come help out on GitHub. Um, we've got a super friendly team around the whole thing, and we're all OSS full-time, so we can give you support whenever you need it. Um, so links. Nodezu is at github.com forward slash nodezu. Fuge is at github.com forward slash forward slash apparatus forward slash fuge. Um, fuge will run any sort of microservice um, you can think of, as long as it's a standard JavaScript uh, file and it spins up, you can, you can run them in Fuge. Um, slides are available here. This is myself. Thank you very much. Any questions?